when we're thinking about rotation, it's helpful to differentiate between revolution and rotation. So revolution is moving around an external axis. An example of that would be the Earth moving around the Sun would be an example of revolution. It's moving around an external axis. In this case, the axis is going through the Sun. Rotation is moving around an internal axis. An example of this would be the Earth rotating around its axis. So that would be an example of rotation. When something is rotating like a merry-go-round, and imagine this is a top-down view of a merry-go-round, it can have both a linear speed and an angular speed. A linear speed is the distance over time, and linear speed will depend on how far you are away from the axis of rotation. So for example, if you are at this point here, which we'll call A, compared to if you're on the edge here, which we'll call B, uh, B is going to have a greater linear speed than A, and the reason for that is because B is traveling a larger circle than A. A is traveling a smaller circle. So to calculate the linear speed, we take the total distance traveled divided by the time. And because the distance travel is a circle, we can say it's 2 pi r divided by the time for one circle, which would be a period. So a period is the time, which we use capital T, is the time for one complete circle. And that would allow you to calculate the linear speed. And so once again, the farther you are from the uh, axis of rotation, the greater your linear speed. Now angular speed uh, is different. Angular speed is the rotations over time. The symbol for angular speed is the Greek letter omega. And to calculate omega, you would take the number of rotations that you're timing divided by the time to make those rotations. And if you're timing in seconds, uh, then your units would be RPS, revolutions per second. If you're measuring in minutes, then your units would be RPM, revolutions per per minute. Now, there are other units that you can use for angular speed, such as radians. Uh, you can also use degrees. Um, but for this level of conceptual physics, we're going to just stick with RPM and RPS. Because the number of rotations per time for A and B are going to be the same, we would say that the angular speed of A is equal to the angular speed of B. Because for every time that A goes around this platform, goes makes a real complete a circle, B will also make a complete circle. So they have the same angular speed. However, as far as the linear speed is concerned, the linear speed of A is going to be less than the linear speed of B because B is traveling a greater distance over the same amount of time. And so it's going to have a greater linear speed. Now there's a relationship between linear speed and angular speed, and that's this. The linear speed is equal to radius times the angular speed. By radius, we're talking about the distance from the axis of rotation to where the object is located. So if the object is located further away, then you can see that the r is going to be bigger. And if the r is bigger, then the linear speed is bigger, which makes sense. If the object is closer and the r is less, then the linear speed is also going to be slower. The angular speed will be the same as long as it's on the same platform uh, making the rotation. So here's a practice question. Let's say an object was at location A, and we move the object to location B. And we want to know how has its linear speed changed. So moving from A to B, let's say that B was twice the distance from the center as A, then the R would be two times. So if an R is two times, then the linear speed is two times. So the object at location B would have twice the speed compared to location A. However, the angular speed would still be the same as long as they're on the same platform. 
Now let's take a look at the rule of balance. How do we know if something is going to balance or if it's going to rotate? So here we've got a seesaw. It's on a pivot uh, fulcrum. And on the left hand side is a two kilogram and it's one, two, three spaces away. So over here there is uh, three amounts of spaces away. And then I have a three kilogram object and where am I going to put it? So I can try it at a different location. But it turns out that it's going to balance when I put it at this location right here, which is going to, going to be uh, two spaces away. And so what is the rule of balance? So we notice that two kilograms times three gives me six. So I have six on the left hand side and the right hand two times three is six. And so those two are equal. And so for a seesaw, uh, as long as the mass times the length from the location to the pivot, so I'll put distance and I'm gonna put left, okay, is equal to the mass on the right, uh, times the distance on the right, uh, as long as those two are equal, then it will balance. If there were more than one object, let's say there was another object over here that was one kilogram, and another object over here that was one kilogram, then we would just add that object as well. As long as they equal on the left-hand side and the right-hand side, then the seesaw will balance. Another way to think about this is the idea of torque, uh, which we will develop next. Um, but the basic idea is that if the torque in one direction balances the torque in the other direction, uh, then it will balance. We'll look at that next. So I like to think of torque as a twisting force, but I like to put the force in quotes because it's not actually a force because force is measured in newtons, uh, but a torque is not measured in newtons. Uh, torque depends on three things. The first is force. So in the wrench below, um, if the size of the arrow represents the amount of force, then A would have the least amount of torque because there's least amount of force. B would have the medium amount of torque and C would have the greatest amount of torque because it has the greatest amount of force. So the greater the force, the greater the torque. Torque also depends on the direction of the force. So in the example below, Wrench A would have the most amount of torque because it's 90 degrees. And you get the most amount of torque when it's 90 degrees. C would have the least amount of torque because it's pointed directly at the axis of rotation. And B would be somewhere in between. So the direction of the force affects the amount of torque there is. And the greatest amount of torque is when it's 90 degrees. Torque is also affected by the point at which the force is applied. The farther away the force is, the greater the torque. So in the example below, uh, C would have the greatest amount of torque because that force is farther away from the axis of rotation. Uh, wrench A would have the least amount of torque because that force is the closest to the axis of rotation. There are different ways to calculate torque. Some requires some trig, um, but we're going to use the lever arm method. So torque can be calculated by multiplying the lever arm by the force. So here we have a wrench and we have a force and to uh, calculate the torque we just take the force assuming we know the force and we multiply it uh, by the lever arm. And the lever arm to, to figure that out um, you're going to take the line of action which is this line along the force and then you're going to find the perpendicular line that goes through the axis of rotation. And this perpendicular line that goes through the axis of rotation is called the lever arm. So once again the lever arm, to find the lever arm, you simply uh, take draw the line of action or the line of force, the line that goes through the force, and you also draw the line that's perpendicular to the lever arm, to the line of force that goes through the axis of rotation. And that distance right here is your lever arm. Um, so if you know that distance multiplied by the force, then you can calculate the torque. In linear motion we talk about inertia and objects resistance to change in motion. Rotational in inertia is the rotational version of that, which is a resistance to a change in rotational motion. Rotational inertia depends on two factors. The first is mass, the mass of the object, and the second one is the distribution of the mass. 
when we say distribution mass, we're talking about where is the mass located. So here we have two barbells, barbell A and B. You'll notice that barbell A, the weights are much closer uh, to where the hand is. So if you were trying to rotate that with your arm, uh, it would be much easier than B because B, the mass is farther away. So the farther away that the mass is, the greater the rotational inertia. The symbol for rotational inertia is the capital letter I. So this would have greater amount of rotational inertia. Uh, the mass that is closer to the axis of rotation would have a smaller rotational inertia. So if you want to have a lot of rotational inertia, you're going to put the mass further away. If you want less rotational inertia, you would um, have the masses closer to the axis of rotation. So here we have a classic rotational inertia demonstration. It's a race between the hoop and the disc. So they're both started at the same location on this ramp and then they're released. And which one's going to get to the bottom of the ramp first? Every time it turns out that the disc will get to the ground first. And that's because the disc has a smaller rotational inertia while the hoop has a larger rotational inertia. And the reason for that is because of the distribution of mass. Uh, the mass on the hoop is all very far from the axis of rotation, while the disc mass is more spread out. Some of it is closer uh, than, the e than the ones on the edge, and so it's going to have a smaller rotational inertia. Center of mass refers to the average position of the mass. Center of gravity refers to the average position of weight distribution. To find the center of gravity, you can suspend an object from a point and draw a vertical line from the suspension point, and then repeat this uh, from another point, and where the two lines intersect, that is your center of gravity. Since weight and mass are proportional, the center of gravity and the center of mass usually will refer to the same point on an object. An example where they aren't at the same point is if you had a really tall structure, very tall structure that reached to the top of the atmosphere, then the gravitational force up here at the very top is going to be less than the gravitational down here because gravitational force is affected by the gravitational field. And the gravitational field decreases as you go away from the surface of the Earth. So in a case like that, um, the top, uh, ma the mass on the top part of it is going to weigh less than the mass on the bottom. So it's not going to be ex exactly uh, in the middle. It's going to be a little bit lower. It's going to be a little bit lower um, uh, on this structure. So on this structure, the center of mass would still be in the middle. Uh, however, the center of gravity, so center of mass, would still be in the middle. However, the center of gravity will be lower uh, because uh, the, the bottom part is closer to the surface of the Earth. Greater gravitational field is going to be heavier, so the center of gra gravity will be lower. Um, typically, we're not going to deal with this situation, so typically the center of mass location will be the same as the center of gravity location. Center of gravity is helpful to understanding whether an object will topple over if you tilt it a little bit. So um, on the left box here, uh, if you look at the center of gravity, if I dot all the way down, uh, as long as it's within within the base um, and not past the edge of the base, uh, then it's not going to topple over. However, if the center of gravity is not supported and it goes past the edge of the base, then it will topple over.